Uh, my name is Sam Eric Rutman, and I'm your host. And uh, it, this is our second op episode that we uh, that we have done. We are going out live on a weekly basis. And uh, if you missed the first episode, uh, you can see it in. If you go to the winning dot training, you will find the replay. So uh, I'd like to say hello to all the viewers who are joining us. Please. Put in your comments, where are you watching from? And uh, if you who are viewing, could you write in winning.training? That will help everyone to find the link where the replay can be found. So this is a, uh, a absolutely a fantastic show and we are very excited to, to have you with us. And our episodes are brought to you in partnership with Winning, Malta Hotel and Restaurant Association, Visit Malta and Ministry of Tourism Malta. So we are delighted to have you here with us today. So then, uh, thank you very much again for, for taking the time to join us. And we will start with our uh, first guest and I will welcome uh, Sarkan Seilan from Bodrum. Good afternoon, Eric. Yes, good afternoon and a warm welcome to our to, to our episode. And uh, and you're from Bodrum, from uh, Bodrum Promotional Foundation. So could you share with us uh, the? Can you share with us uh, about Bodrum and what's special and what attracts people to come there? Thank you very much, Jas. First of all, I would like to say hi to all the distinguished guests and I would like to thank you to Malta Authority and especially for you for this wonderful organization. Uh, just uh, I want to welcome everybody from this uh, sunny uh, Mediterranean village, Bodrum. Just it's one of the most important holiday destinations uh, in Turkey and also in Mediterranean. We are a small, uh, not a significant village of 200,000 uh, inhabitants. It's just a peninsula close to the Greek island coast and uh, just on the southwest of Turkey. Uh, we have uh, approximately 3,500 years of history in the area. And it's well known by the foreign and the Turkish guests, especially because of its wonderful climate. Uh, especially uh, 11 uh, different bays that are all located in the different parts of the peninsula. Uh, a great historical heritage, uh, a great historical background, and also which is popular by its uh, entertainment, uh, restaurants, nightlife, uh, plus uh, its um, Blue Voyage, which is very significant to this village, which is done by uh, wooden gullets, that are created here for luxury cruises. These are uh, wooden yachts. And also uh, because of its climate, we have availability to have tourism activities for approximately eight months of the year. Very good. Now, could you give us a recap of uh, 2019 and then leading to, uh, leading to 2020? How was the business yes. for uh, in Bodrum? Yes, uh, 2019 was uh, a very uh, flourishing and very uh, motivating year for this uh, destination uh, because of the uh, regional crisis and uh, the effects of the global crisis around the world. In uh, 2016, we have a decline in the tourism industry around the region, but starting with 2018, we had an increase in the numbers and the figures and 2019 was not the best of the times, maybe, but it was a very motivating season for 2020 till the uh, pandemic period. Uh, we had a figure of approximately 900,000 uh, guests all around the world visiting the area. And uh, because of the uh, uh, foreign tourists coming from different destinations and from different markets, uh, in 2019, uh, we had a very motivating season, as I mentioned before. Uh, then uh, 2020, for 2020, we had a very good figures in terms of reservation and tours, including the uh, cruise industry, uh, Blue Voyage, hotels, tours, tour operators. 
and flight numbers was uh, very very uh, motivating for us till the beginning of pandemic unfortunately like all the mediterranean cities we had a big hit with the beginning of 2020 and we have serious cancellations serious cancellations and uh, unfortunately the sector had a great investment to the uh, premises because of the figures that they have in 2019 so they invest a lot of money uh, trusting the figures to, of the 2020 so uh, it created a big gap for the uh, especially for small and medium sized uh, enterprises in the tourism sector they had a big hit unfortunately and the january february and march was a big disappointment and a lose of motivation for all of us we have uh, nearly a cancellation of uh, 50 percent especially from the european market sam and uh, till the beginning of uh, june we couldn't see or uh, understand anything if it's going to be worse or uh, online or bad or or better yeah. we couldn't understand we couldn't understand the figures and uh, uh, how the industry and the people in the tourism industry and also the uh, tourists will react to the current pandemic situation uh, we had our uh, season with local turkish tourists because bodrum itself is one of the biggest uh, attractive destinations for the Turkish travel market, which is also huge. And uh, this is the number one destination for the Turks. And this became a very uh, good uh, lifesaver for the industry. And the Turks, because of they are very uh, stressed under the pandemic conditions, when the restrictions are ended, uh, it, with the end of, with the beginning of June, we have a very serious uh, Turkish local tourist attraction to the destination which gives a, a life breath to the industry and with the beginning of august thanks god that we have some uh, flights coming to the international terminals <laughs> we had some uh, foreign flights arriving to border international terminal but during that period we have a miracle issue that um, the russian and the ukrainian market bloomed because they are not allowed to the european markets so we have a dramatic increase. We have a serious increase in the, especially in the Ukrainian and the Russian market. And normally in Bodrum, uh, the summer season ends for the foreign tourists approximately at the end of uh, September. But because of this uh, Russian and Ukrainian boom, uh, till the end of October, till now, we have uh, a significant amount of tourists traveling around. And uh, if I have to be honest, it's not the worst of the season that we have. Still, we have uh, more than 50 percentage of loss from the previous year and maybe more from the expected of the 2020. But uh, we survived. We survived. Now, uh, Ukrainians are the number one as foreign tourists. But I have to mention again that uh, the Turkish tourists are always number one in Bodrum. They are always here. And uh, when we talk about the foreign markets, uh, the Ukra Ukrainian market is number one, uh, the Russian market is number two, and the Polish market, which they have a serious amount of tourists coming here. And uh, very surprisingly, we have the serious amounts of tourists coming from the Balkan countries, from Serbia, from Croatia. We have some arrivals from there. And this pandemic gives us a interesting opportunity to meet with new customers. Excellent, talk excellent. About foreign guests. Yeah. So, uh, what has changed in boardroom in light of the COVID nineteen? Uh, or and you notice there that there are certain uh, visitors who are coming year after year from the same destinations, mm -hmm. and now we have a new uh, getting more Polish, and it's very very good to hear that. But from your point of view, uh, what has changed in boardroom, or if anything else has? Uh, yes, we have we have some changes seriously. First of all, uh, the population increased in the area. The Turkish tourists uh, who are coming here for holidays for uh, liaisers are now becoming residents <laughs> in the village, and they are uh, just choosing to stay here 
And also, this is also a popular idea for uh, the tourists also, because in the, during the COVID period, people are trying to uh, just leave, try to leave from the places with, with big cities. They are not. They are trying to change their lives. It created a new lifestyle, and Bodrum significantly become one of the best attractions to live. Because we have all the uh, modern uh, infrastructure that you can have in a big city, plus you still have a wonderful sea and uh, a local life and the country life. So the population uh, significantly increased in the village. If we can be, we are turning to a city now. This is number one change after COVID. The the second change is of course uh, till now the Dutch and the British market was number one, and uh, different than Antalya. Uh, Bodrum was not very familiar with the Ukrainian and Russian markets. We always have Russian and Ukrainian guests, but and they had been never been number one. So uh, they are, uh, of course, uh, they have some different attitudes and different expectations in the area. And uh, our tourism uh, economy, tourism sector is just combining with them, with these new uh, destinations. And also because of this huge attraction, and now Bodrum is uh, a serious uh, place for investments. Uh, we are having almost all the international brands in Bodrum, like Kempinski, Hilton, Swiss. And now during this period, more international brands are seriously investing in the city. Now we have Four Seasons coming on the way. Uh, Ritz Carlton is coming on the way. Uh, according to the local governor, uh, approximately three to five uh, billion uh, dollars of investment is on the way. So, uh, by coincidence or by chance, uh, Bodrum may become a center of attraction for investments, uh, and uh, the economy is booming. If I have to be honest. And where is this investment coming from? If you are able to share that. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, just coming from the international investment groups, not specifically from one country, but these are the groups that are making, you know, these groups all in the uh, Europe, uh, Russia and uh, Middle East. These investment groups uh, are also collecting the hotels or the tourism investments that are uh, lived unattended or unfinished. Now they are all taken by some big groups for uh, investments and also because of this increase in population, Real estate, real estate market is booming also, both for constructions and both for hiring. And the recent stocks, uh, the recent real estate stocks that have been staying still for the past five to six years, maybe, are all finished in the f five to six months. Excellent. And uh, so uh, you are in charge of the Boardroom Promotional Foundation. So what is next yeah. for Boardroom? What is in your uh, focus. Yeah, now the uh, Bodrum is uh, becoming very popular for uh, as a luxury destination, as a luxury tourism destination. Till now, we have uh, the tourists, uh, tourists coming from all different countries and also both coming from different economic values. But now, in the COVID area, uh, we experienced a huge increase in uh, the luxury tourism. Uh, we have uh, five big marinas in the uh, city, and they are all of them is almost overbooked at the moment. Uh, and the Bodrum Promotion Foundation is to keep the image that Bodrum has uh, a product to offer for all uh, parties in all uh, earnings and in all economic sections. But now in the following uh, two years, it seems that uh, we will be more increasingly fo focusing on the uh, luxury market, luxury segment market, uh, both in Russia and in Europe. That is excellent. So all the viewers now, you have heard some interesting update from uh, by Sergan about uh, Bodrum. So just write in your comments or any questions that you have, and we will address them at the, at the end of the show. So. Uh, Thank you very much again, uh, Serkan, for, uh, for this update. I really appreciate it. And I'm very glad to see that uh, uh, you seem to be all smiles, that things are, uh, you have the good things going for, for your boardroom. I, I'm really happy about that. We all share Thank that, that happiness with you. So please stay with us now. Uh, uh, and we will, I will bring you back uh, towards the end of the show. And uh, I will invite now 
uh, next uh, Nikos Hajos. So uh, thank you again, Serkan. I'll be here. Thank you, Eric. So uh, my next guest is uh, Nikos Hajos. He's a strategic advisor uh, for hotel investments. Uh, welcome, Nikos. And you are from Athens. Yes, uh, thank you, Sam Eric. Uh, glad to be here and to share uh, with the viewers about uh, the status of the COVID here in Greece in general for the hospitality. Um, is there something in particular you would like me to uh, focus on first? Uh, well, if you can give sort of a uh, recap of 2019, you have to see from your point of view, since you have been looking at the uh, developments for uh, Greece, uh, Cyprus, uh, and Malta, for that matter. If you can share, uh, but how, how was 2019 uh, leading into uh, 2020? Sure. Well, 2019 was a record year uh, once again for the Greek tourism industry. We had um, a record number of 33 million roundly of uh, international tourists. And at the same time, there was a slight increase on the per capita um, euro spent per tourism, uh, per tourist, excuse me. With regards to the occupancies and the um, average room rates for the hotels and specifically for the resorts, uh, that was also a record year for the majority of the resorts throughout the country, the islands and the mainland too. Uh, but at the same time, there was also a pretty strong momentum with regards to new investments, uh, whether that would be greenfield developments or convergence of uh, other buildings, office buildings, for example, and uh, convergence of existing hotels and actually the, their upgrading uh, to a higher standard combined with uh, an international brand, uh, whether under franchise or management agreement. So 2019 overall uh, was a great year for the country in whole, both in terms of number of uh, tourist arrivals, uh, perf uh, performance of the hotels all around the country, but also for a new foreign direct investment coming into the industry. Very good. Now, uh, now looking into the 2020, uh, what has changed besides uh, uh, perhaps some travel advisories and so on, but from uh, investment point of view and development point of view, uh, how is this uh, 2020 look like for you? And what would be the type of hotels which are performing better uh, than others? Well, I'll, I'll answer it, uh, one question at a time. So I'm going to start from the end. Basically, uh, right now, despite the fact that uh, globally we have been experiencing uh, the worst season ever, I would say. Um, in Greece in particular, the resort sector, uh, strangely enough, at least the hotels that uh, decided to open their doors for their guests, actually have done better than what they were hoping that they would do. So, and I think there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, is that uh, only about 60% of the total hotel supply uh, opened up this summer. Uh, which meant that there was lesser supply for, you know, the demand that was coming in. At the same time, the prices that the hotel, the Greek hoteliers of those resorts were charging were not significantly low in order to attract uh, the tourists that were coming in. And at the same time, capable management teams managed to really streamline the operating expenses and basically try to do more with less. So this had, uh, as a result, uh, a number of hoteliers that I've spoken with and uh, in all major resort markets of the country to actually um, have been positively surprised by the results that we're able to achieve. Now, of course, always taking into consideration that you know, COVID has basically created a significant hindrance in attracting more tourists for the uh, for the reasons that we all know but nevertheless uh the majority of those hoteliers which again are the exception uh to the rule managed uh, not only to actually reduce their expected losses but actually some of them have made uh profit which is a major achievement uh in times like this 
Now going on the other side, the city hotels of the country, and primarily in the two major cities of Athens and Thessaloniki, unfortunately have been suffering severely uh, for the simple reason that whoever came as a tourist to the country have mostly gone through charter flights that flew directly to the destinations. And at the same time, the city hotels have also um, have been focusing on MICE business groups. And uh, unfortunately, this sector has been severely hit and uh, nobody knows how long it's going to take before uh, we can see some rebound. Now, with regard to the hotel investment from the other side, um, there is a it's, it's an interesting story. Uh, I've personally dealt with a number of deals that um, have slowed down, but they did not pause at all. Um, and I think this has to do primarily with uh, with the uh, investment risk profile of those investors. There are certain investors that are more conservative, and of course, considering what's happening right now uh, in the world, they have decided to basically put on hold any investment activity. Uh, but there are others that basically they see the current situation as a great opportunity to move in fast and find the opportunities that no one else would look at. So we have, we have uh, investors of this nature and uh, would say that uh, they have been capitalizing on the available few deals and i'm sure that they will benefit as soon as things will start to um to recover so i cannot say that uh, the damage due to COVID in terms of uh, hotel investment has been um severe but uh looking also for 2021 i think that uh, there will be an even further growth in the momentum of uh, both investment funds family offices and high net worth individuals uh, wanting to bring their capital into Greece and invest it. I just think that it will basically be focused more into conversions rather than greenfield developments. Uh, uh, from looking at from the market point of view, what markets do you see a recovery promise for, for leading to 2021? when you say markets with regards within Greece or, or within the... It, uh, it's in regards to uh, travelers either with the Greece or, or Cyprus or, uh, or in that, the area that you're covering. I, I think that um, especially in Greece and Cyprus, the, uh, the first sector that is going to recover, in my opinion, will be the leisure. Because uh, first of all, now... The, uh, a, a large number of hotels, of resort hotels, have basically um, adopted uh, the new COVID uh, measures that uh, definitely make the tourists and the, in general the visitors for these hotels to feel safe. And if you think about it, it's also a matter of psychology. You know, the entire world has been really suffering through you know, lockdowns uh, through uh, limitation in their movements. And uh, for sure, the moment that things start getting a bit better, whether through the discovery of a medicine or of an injection, I think the first thing that they would want to do uh, is to take a vacation. And for that reason, the, the leisure sector I believe not only in Greece and Cyprus, but in general in the Mediterranean basin, uh, will be the first one to recover, followed by the city hotels, which I believe they're, they're going to take up either a bit or much longer um, to get back on their feet. Uh, if you're looking at uh, uh, some, what are some changes that uh, will not happen in the industry, for instance, consumer behavior, service? Uh, guest experience or valuations or other things that you see uh, that will not change in our industry? Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I think that um, the human interaction, um, I believe even though now is uh, it's heavily limited, I think it's going to come back because, you know, I cannot see personally hospitality without the human element into it. Now, I think that um, 
perhaps in the economy or the limited service sector, where of course, automating of different functions also result in uh, cost reductions. I think that's gonna be basically adopted uh, on a permanent or on a more permanent uh, basis. But uh, when it comes to full service and luxury, I think that uh, it will be impossible to replace um, the human interaction and the warmth that you know uh, the staff can offer to a guest with uh, any high-tech robot can offer. Absolutely. I mean, service and uh, human interaction, that's the glue that keeps a hotel together. Correct. Yes, yes. Um, just in general, the industry sentiment, since you are talking with uh, a number of parties, whether the investors and hotels, what is in general the, the feel and the mood uh, in the industry from your, how you see it? There is, of course, there is great concern about how the 2021 winter will pass um, because, again, the uh, the initial hopes that we will be able to get um, the injection or the medicine sometime towards the end of the year, I think they have been proven wrong. Um, at the same time, there is a second wave of pandemic and uh, the new cases all over the world have been exponentially increasing to an extent that uh, a number of countries now are considering um, again, national lockdowns. I think whether a national lockdown will take place or not um, will have to depend on the financial ability of a country and its economy to um, to be able to shut down its economy for you know two weeks or for a month. I don't think that countries like Greece, after doing that for you know almost a couple of months in during the summer. Uh, will have this, the resources to basically go through that um, act again. But I think that um, it will be definitely uh, interesting to see what other measures uh, the government of Greece, of Cyprus, or of Malta uh, will try to implement to at least try to control the, uh, the growth of the new cases so the curve can become uh, a bit flatter. Thank you. Uh, we just got the guest comment from Senaz in, in, in Cyprus. She says, I totally agree with you. And uh, we have a few more questions coming up, but I, I like to leave those until the end. So just stay patient. Uh, just say a few hellos to John Podaras uh, based in Dubai. So thank you very much for joining us. And a few other LinkedIn uh, viewers. So I very please appreciate that you are here. Uh, could you just put your name uh, and where you are viewing from uh, and so we can just say, hel hel say hello to you. And I just want to mention the, again that our uh, episode is uh, are brought to you in partnership with the Malta Hotel and Restaurant Association and winning Visit Malta and uh, Ministry of Tourism of Malta. Now, if you'd like to see the replay of our, our, our first episode, which was last week where we were viewing, uh, talking about the Nordic countries, uh, you can find, if you go to the winning.training, that the portal, you will see the, uh, you can view the webinars over there. And if there, anyone wants to share with me here and write down in the comments, winning.training, uh, that will help everyone else who is viewing this show to, uh, to click the link and, uh, and to view this. So thank you very much, uh, Nikos Hajos, for your input. I really My appreciate pleasure. it. If you can stay stay on and t until the end, I will bring everyone together and we will have a continue our discussion. And uh, I'm very pleased for our next guest who is joining us. And I'd like to welcome uh, uh, His Excellency Hisham Zhao. He was a former Prime, uh, Prime Minister of Tourism of uh, Egypt. So, uh, hello, Dr. Hesham, and uh, thank you for your patience to, to stay on uh, until this time. All your viewers around the world, and uh, I'm saying hello to you and my friends from uh, Turkey and uh, Greece. And uh, it's a very interesting discussion so far, so thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hesham, I really appreciate it. Uh, you have a great experience in, in uh, travel and, uh, uh, and tourism industry and 
so we, were, we would be very interested to hear about your views and considering that Egypt has experienced uh, peaks and valleys in tourism arrival since uh, 2010, could you share us with the, the current situation uh, in Egypt has affected because of the global pand pandemic and possibly in the, what are some inspiration you can share how we can move forward? Okay, thank you very much. Yes, I did have my share about those uh, valleys and the, uh, the tips of the mountains in that industry. Uh, um, yes, uh, from 2010 to date, we had uh, a zigzag uh, situation when it comes to the influx or inflow of tourists into Egypt. But uh, as far as uh, the Egyptian tourism um, experience, we had it for a long time, but I always remind myself and my colleagues in my country and around the world, uh, like I listened to uh, uh, your Nordic uh, guests uh, in the last episode, where they said that tourism uh, may get sick, but never dies. And that's uh, very, very true for our industry. So I just want to comfort everybody else that uh, um, the uh, proper flow of tourism will come back. We need to have some patience and uh, belief that our industry is still vibrating and will continue to be uh, so for the coming uh, decades. As far as Egypt, if you look to the figures that we had between the year 2000 and 2010, there was incidents that uh, we had uh, drops because of one incident or other, a, tourist, a terrorist attack or so, or the famous 9-11, in 2001, all this affected the flow, but the zigzag was there. But if you look to the figure in the year 2000, we received only 5 million uh, tourists. And in the year 2010, we received almost 15 million. To be specific, 14.7 million tourists arrived. So in spite of the zigzag, the curve always, or the point of that uh, uh, curve uh, looked upwards. And I think all of the rest of the... Uh, uh, of uh, our colleagues around the world witness the same. Even if we have some bad times, things move in a better direction uh, immediately. Maybe this time is a very difficult and very strange situation with the pandemic. Uh, of course, Egypt uh, is really suffering a lot, like many other destinations. Maybe the destinations of Turkey and Greece who did a little bit better than us uh, this summer. Uh, but I believe uh, the treatment or the vaccine uh, will be sometime, I hope, soon, because it's not the industry alone, not the tourism. It's the whole economy of the world is suffering. And accordingly, I believe uh, things will be, uh, will be better in that sense in the, in the future. Um, but you need to be, even in those times, uh, on one hand, positive, yes, about the future, but you need to act. My advice, because my experience is basically between the private sector and public sector for the many years I worked in that business, uh, but I will start with the, uh, with the fact that in a country like Egypt, I think the same thing in Greece or Turkey or uh, all around the world. Um, the public sector, the government, the minister of tourism, if he's there, is basically working on leveling the environment for the private sector to work. So the private sector has to get in touch with the government. You are the experts, the private sector. You are the hands-on people with the hands-on experience that you need to flow with your info to the uh, person in charge to help uh, him or her uh, sitting in the driving seat in the government uh, to draft the, 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 the good policies ahead. So... Uh, my experience myself at one time because of some incidents that brought some of the source markets, like for instance, the German market that is very important to Egypt was down at one point. Um, I just uh, took the bull by its horn. I, I traveled uh, to Germany. I met the officials and not necessarily the tourism officials. Actually, people at the foreign affairs. I mean, uh, people that are giving travel advisory uh, and advices to the public, the potential consumer, the tourist, uh, not to travel to a specific destination. You need to work on that because any promotional activities you do will be hindered if this obstacle is there. So, uh, for instance, I would give uh, a salute to Turkey because I understood that last summer the Minister of Tourism took the Minister, as I heard, the Minister of uh, uh, Health and left to some source countries and worked with them to see their request 
uh, in case they uh, can open the door for tourists to flow to the destination, what to do. So this is an example. What you should do is ensure that to have a two-way communication with the source markets at large, and then work on forward. Of course, I would take that opportunity also, Sam, to say that uh, things will move into stages. As I heard now, and the, the rest of our viewers heard, um, the domestic market is important in these bad times. Domestic market is growing uh, in the world. So uh, uh, you need to ad address that market very well and see its needs uh, because that will be a savior on those uh, transitional periods. Then you move into uh, understanding the international profile of guests uh, in the future. I would imagine, as we just heard, concentrating on the resorts, on the open areas, on vacationing, on, on change, real change, uh, will be important. But who will travel? I think also the younger crowd, the millennials, will be a very good market because the older generation will tend to move domestically but the younger generation will move. That will bring us to technology. You need to address the issue of uh, the digital uh, transformation that took leaps in that COVID-19 uh, 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 situation that we're in today. These are elements I believe we should take into consideration, all of us, in the coming period. I don't want to, uh, to dwell if you'd like to ask me anything else, I'm at your service. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Dr. Hisham. You have covered uh, really some uh, wide, wide things, and I, I am, I'm very. Uh, when I, in preparation uh, for meeting you here digitally, uh, I was quite impressed of how you, during your time as the Minister of uh, Tourism, uh, took the, as you called, bull by the horns, and you lead, you led a, a campaign really to to bring back and inspire. Uh, uh, yeah. Some countries who had, for whatever reason, they have decided not to open the doors to go to Egypt, but you did that. I think that's to, to salute you and, and also an inspiration for all of us. But I have a question now. Uh, what is the industry sentiment in general in Egypt at the moment? What are, are they expecting the government to, to take care of things for them? Or are they also proactive as uh, you were when you were in, in the seat? Well, um, uh, it's a sort of a mix. I think the government did, uh, like many other governments, uh, did lend uh, a helping hand when it comes to uh, delay of payments. Uh, even the central bank did uh, waive the charges of credit card uh, uh, charges, plus uh, a six months uh, delay in payments in that sense. Uh, for the sector itself, uh, uh, the government lent a hand to pay for the wages uh, of uh, particularly the rank and file uh, employees um, that took place starting last uh, March April as I remember and the uh, uh, and that initiative uh, ran until uh, last end of September and early October um, the uh, markets that uh, reacted uh, to the promotional activities by uh, by the government and by the private sector uh, was basically from the Eastern Europe. I think the same thing that happened in, in Turkey happened in Egypt. Uh, we had more of your Ukraines, not uh, Russians, but Ukraines, Polish, uh, more traffic from that part of Europe. Uh, and I think uh, also the British started to appear because EasyJet uh, uh, started its flights into our resorts, um, direct flights, not a lot uh, as frequencies, uh, as far as frequency is concerned, but at least the movement started, and that is a good sign. Uh, we still have uh, great high hopes, not for the moment, because naturally two elements is taking place in the source markets, particularly in Western Europe, which is a very important source market for our country. Um, there is lockdowns, as we are all witnessing now in Europe, in France, in Germany, in Spain, and even in um, expected in uh, in Britain, or maybe short lockdowns, but uh, the tendency is there for that. So I don't think any um, decision for uh, flying into the country from that region, that part of the world, to the Mediterranean at large basin, I think will be delayed. So uh, we should be thinking, all of us, and I think that's what's happening as, as sentiments is concerned in Egypt, um, for next uh, spring and summer, not this winter necessarily, 
Um, and I think the, there is high hopes for that. And I shared them that by then, I hope the situation would be different. Uh, the, this doesn't mean that uh, the flow of the business will come back uh, very strong from that uh, expected uh, date in 2021. But I think gradually it will take place. So we need to sharpen our uh, pencils when it comes to our finances. We need to see uh, uh, out-of-the-box uh, ideas. I heard uh, your Indian uh, guests at one time speaking about new mobile application uh, for guests that will help for the situation when it comes to COVID-19 contact contactless uh, uh, usage of the mobile uh, within the hotel uh, premises. I think issues like using technology to lessen your costs uh, beside the manpower is needed at that uh, period where you lower your head uh, until it passes. I'm sure it will pass and I'm sure uh, I have a strong feeling by the mid 2021 and onwards things will, uh, will change gradually for our industry. One last thing I'd like to mention is connectivity. Without airlines being part of that equation, um, you will not realize good numbers. And uh, there is a big problem when it comes uh, with the aviation sector. We need us as uh, accommodation sector, as tourism sector, to, uh, to join forces with the aviation sector to see what measures to be taken. People are still afraid to get into a confined Airline, uh, uh, aircraft, and uh, they do not know that the air quality in an aircraft maybe is like the operating room in a hospital. The uh, filters, etc., all that kind of information should be properly disseminated by all of us for the travelers and give a lending hand to the aviation sector. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Hisham. Uh, just a final note that we both are involved with the Mediterranean. Uh, tourism uh, foundation and uh, and uh, that's where we, we had the opportunity to hear you speak on 2018 uh, what are your thoughts about uh, uh, that the different uh, the mediterranean basin could work together to promote not only the the one country but also can promote the whole basin when it comes to cruises and, and other kind of travel well, I, 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 I just uh, want to remind uh, you and the viewers and our colleagues that the uh, Mediterranean Basin has always been a great attraction for the whole world. Uh, it attracted one third of the tourism uh, pie of the world uh, uh, until 2019. And I think it will continue to do that. But uh, I think the Mediterranean should work together in, uh, in uh, promotional activities, joint prom promotional activities, uh, exposing its culture, its beauty, its diversity. Uh, uh, and accordingly, I think uh, uh, a lot of effort could be done. Joint efforts between neighboring countries could be done for the uh, inter, uh, international uh, travel. Having said that, uh, to, and to be pragmatic and practical, neighboring countries can make joint programs in the Mediterranean basin for the long haul destinations. As uh, a lot of my colleagues would share me and agree with me that people coming, let's say, from the USA to the Mediterranean, it's not like the European, which is very close, the European source market is very close. They go to single destinations. Uh, but um, um, attracting uh, those long haul uh, clients, South America, USA, Far East, coming, they can come and visit um, more than one country in their visit. So uh, I, I do welcome uh, the initiative of uh, us as Mediterranean countries to work together, particularly the neighboring countries, uh, to work with the airline industry and work on promotion for long-haul uh, passengers or tourists. Thank you, Dr. Hisham. Uh, just a comment from one of our viewers, Moin Kandel. He said, I agree with Dr. Hisham that the future of tourism is is the younger generation and therefore the industry should gear to them with more advanced ports and infrastructure to accommodate the new technology. So uh, thank you very much and uh, for your, for your uh, inspirational thoughts today, Dr. Hisham. And I will bring everyone in now uh, for our uh, final portion of our episode. So we have here on the screen with us, uh, uh, we have uh, 
our friends Sergan and, and, and Nikos, and then, of course, Dr. Hisham. So uh, uh, let's see if there are if anyone any additional questions. I have one question that comes from uh, uh, John Podaras from, uh, from Dubai. Uh, and he says, what advice to you do you have for investors who may say, seize a great opportunity but may well face a considerable time lag before seeing positive cash flows until the market recovers. That is, uh, that is his comments. Uh, if I can get the full, full comment here into the screen, I will put it here. So uh, what advice do you have for investors who may seize a great opportunity, but may well face a considerable time lag before they can get the positive cash flow? Uh, Nikos, do you want to take a start? Sure. On this? Sure. You know, uh, I think that um, a number of um, opportunities that are right now uh, being pursued by investors are opportunities that uh, will be actually completed in the next uh, 24 months. So basically, uh, in that way, the investors that actually will be investing their funds um, have already taken into consideration the fact that you know, the recovery might take a bit longer than expected. We all hope that it won't be, but it might as well. Uh, and therefore, they have already, you know, done their uh, capital budgeting exercise, um, looking at the horizon of 24 months uh, to start start making some money. Now, they are, you know, for investors that actually are looking at opportunities that uh, may as well uh, start producing uh, cash flows from the next season. There, I would think that uh, they would have to be a bit more creative and especially for Greece, because I don't think that there is a similar program in Cyprus or Malta. They should definitely capitalize on the different incentive grants that are being uh, offered by the European Union uh, for development. And uh, these grants can be quite generous depending on the uh, geographic location of the property. So these can go up to 40% of the total cost of investment. So we're talking about significant capital that is being given away uh, to the right candidates. So that would be, you know, for me, um, a piece of advice for investors that uh, my friend John Podaras uh, is looking at right now. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so uh, I was just looking at some other questions or comments. Uh, uh, let me turn over then to just some general questions. Uh, what, do you see, what do you see is the future of travel? Uh, Dr. Hisham, do you have, what is your, looking at the future, what is the future of travel in your, in your view? I, uh, it's very difficult actually to, uh, to answer that question, to be very honest with you. But uh, what we can agree all, I think uh, my friends Nikos and uh, Serkan would agree with me and yourself, Sam, that post-COVID clients and travel will be different. I mean, there will be more focus uh, on issues of uh, safety uh, when it comes to traveling. Uh, the issues of uh, what will happen to me as a, uh, as a tourist if I arrive into destination and I have a health problem. Not necessarily COVID, but generally. Because COVID made health come to the forefront. So uh, our destination infrastructure when it comes to health areas should be ready for that and we should be always comforting clients in that respect so getting close to that area getting close to the insurance companies that work uh, on uh, health insurance issues and uh, that will be one aspect the second is understanding the profile of the new client the new client will be more savvy because of the fact sitting at home in front of this thing, in front of us all now, that laptop or computer, and digitally going all around the world and uh, having a, uh, a massive influx of information uh, will be having an effect on the decision-making process uh, when it comes to the destination uh, pickup, the airline, etc. So, and that client or potential I believe, I'll go back to what I said just shortly ago, would be a younger version in the, uh, in the beginning of the return of the business. So we need to adhere the profile of the millennials, the younger crowd under 50, 
to see their needs in a destination. I would imagine, as Nico said, the resorts will do a little bit better at the beginning than the city hotels. So what will the resorts should be prepared for them? Adventure, uh, uh, excitement, etc. together with a caution attitude when it comes to the health issues. Um, I think we should also put into the equation uh, that uh, the issue of technology in promotion will be more and more important in the coming period, be it for investment, as just mentioned by John requesting information. So the destination has to present their opportunities and to tell them, yes, you may hang on for another couple of years. Uh, to have your return of investment, but it probably it will be on a double digit returns rather than a very low one because there will be a flow of uh, traffic in the world after all this um, lockdowns and uh, negativity and all this feeling of being captive uh, and cannot travel. The, there will be a boom for sure down the road and that will have returns. So whoever will be on the launching pad destination-wise, hotel-wise, airline-wise, um, uh, technology-wise, etc. All these issues, the infrastructure of us, for us as uh, uh, professionals in that industry, we should get ready and promote that on our platforms uh, more. I salute Greece when it uh, say, visit Greece while you're at home at one time promotion campaign with lovely music, lovely pictures. Same for Turkey and for Egypt too, trying to say what are we discovering as far as our heritage uh, is concerned, the new discoveries, etc., will entice people to say, yes, when it's possible to travel to Egypt, I'll do it. So the same thing goes for Greece and for Turkey and for the whole world. These are my quick thoughts of my mind now to answer your question, Sam. Thank you, Dr. Hisham. How about you, Serkan? What is your thoughts about the future of travel? Uh, just I would like to uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Hisham, because just uh, he mentioned very important points for the industry. And thank, I would like to thank you, Nikos, also. Uh, the future of Mediterranean tourism is very crucial and very important for the tourism and travel industry. And uh, as His Excellency mentioned, uh, if we can be ready on the launching pad, uh, just covering all the Mediterranean countries, there will be a boom. Uh, in the coming future. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot give a specific date uh, about this uh, launch, but I'm definitely agree with uh, Dr. Hisham that it's going to be soon. And I also uh, have the same idea that it never dies. It can become sick, but it never dies. So uh, technology is very important. And uh, one important thing that all the actors in the travel industry, including the governments, and uh, the sectors must put in mind that all the things that we mentioned as normal before has died. That normal is finished. Now we are talking about something definitely new. Uh, starting from that point, starting from that point, now, uh, since now, the price is the number one priority till now. But now, safety, infrastructure, and the premises uh, reaction with nature is more important. Now, the things that we know before will definitely change. And this change will be a continuous change. Things will not get back to the previous normals in the coming years. So we have to prepare ourselves. But I have to mention it very clearly that it's not only the sector, uh, the governments, the local governments, uh, nationwide governments and the institutes like Mediterranean Foundation, all the actors that are presented in the sector must be ready and must be truly friendly with these new normals. Thank you. Uh, any thoughts, Nikos, anything you'd like to add to this? Well, I, I, first of all, I concur with uh, both uh, what Sirkan and Hisham have, uh, have said. I think that um, we all agree that uh, the, the old normal uh, is dead and the new normal has um, has has risen. Now, for me, the, in order not to repeat um, what everybody else has said, uh, what I would add is that the, uh, you know, what we're going through with COVID, I think, um, is going to create some new opportunities for the evolution of the travel and tourism industry. 
Um, and uh, I think that already we had seen the experiential tourism um, being on uh, on a very good momentum. Now I think that uh, this momentum is going to grow even faster and bigger because tourists will, first of all, want to travel, but at the same time, we want to get new experiences, um, a bit more private, um, and basically go to destinations that are not overly crowded. And that, for me, it's going to create uh, an incredible opportunity for all these destinations in the world that so far have been undiscovered gems. Uh, so, you know, instead of going, for example, to, you know, I'll say here in Greece, uh, Mykonos or Bodrum or, uh, you know, Sham el-Sheikh, they can go to equivalent destinations within those countries that have a lot to offer, they're unspoiled, and they will benefit, the local communities and societies will benefit from infrastructure uh, and tourism-related uh, investment. So I think that's going to be another benefit that's going to come from the crisis that you know the whole world is going through. Yes. Well, I don't want to beat my own drum here, but I have yeah, mentioned yeah, that Finland... May I add something, to, um, may yes, I add something? yes, of course. So I, I just wanted to add to all uh, what we have been uh, saying at the moment, uh, two, two aspects. Uh, this is a good opportunity for us and maybe our friends uh, at the MHRA in Malta or Malta itself can take the initiative for us to create a portal for the Mediterranean base where we can start hopefully in the coming winter in preparation for the summer and the better day, all of us at the same time. And uh, the choice will be good. It's like uh, a big choice for uh, the potential consumer to come and uh, do it. That's one thing we can work as a project, all of us. It will benefit the, the, the industry. It is not true. Uh, 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 competition means that we do not, uh, all of us, put hands together for our Mediterranean basin in that, in that area and, and work together. That's one, one thing. Secondly, to ask our governments, uh, to focus on the promotional issues of geographic specific, not country specific, because the uh, WHO gives numbers and say, let's say Egypt has a, a rise in the uh, infection. But actually you have like in Greece, like in Turkey, like in many other destinations, areas geographically almost free of the COVID. It is uh, actually very safe to travel to. So we need to advise the government to make promotions on geographic specific destinations and tell the world in the source markets to, to, be, uh, to say specifically Egypt, yes, or Greece, yes, or Turkey, but that area, Antalya or Bodrum or uh, uh, the, the Greek islands, this, that, uh, Greek Mykonos or whatever you pick, is uh, these are the, the figures which will show it is very safe to travel to. These are the two advice that I can give at the end of that show. Sorry to uh, <laughs> cut you, Sam. Not at all. I, I, I think what you said was uh, far more <laughs> important because I, I was only one, one to mention that uh, uh, we have found out here in Finland, and I didn't want to beat our own drum here, is that uh, because there has been, Finland has not been considered a mainstream uh, destination for, for international travel. It only, uh, say, as a hub uh, to cross over to, uh, to, to Europe from Asia, for instance. But now we find that there are interests of coming and spend longer time because of the uh, pure air and also sort of the, the, the safety and, and, and sort of the peacefulness. And the, the, what used to be, uh, Rolex used to be a, 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 about quality, but quality is now about, about using time and in, in a way that you can learn something about yourself. So what Nikos mentions about the experiential travel is seem to be something that is now picking up momentum in, in Finland and there are projects being developed around this uh, concept for people who are, uh, are particularly interested to learn something new in a destination that they, they never thought of going before. So that was my, my, my comment I want to make. I have two last questions for you, gentlemen. One is that, uh, uh, and this is something to, about, about you rather than... Uh, and what have you learned about yourself during this period of COVID? What have you learned about yourself during this period about COVID? Anything you want to share, Dr. Hesham? 
Well, <laughs> to be honest, I, I discovered that I was uh, uh, far behind when technology is concerned. I always had a secretary. I never bothered to write emails myself or uh, use the laptop. I became relatively good on that. Not very good yet, but uh, it forced me to, to join the younger generation on understanding more on the uh, technology and use it. And I found it extremely fun uh, in that respect. And uh, it was a nice uh, thing. The issue, the other personal issue is getting closer to the family, uh, particularly in the days when we had curfews of uh, long hours and staying at home and uh, uh, understanding more because a person like myself, I can claim for 10, 15 years, oops, my kids are grown. <laughs> they are uh, uh, they are uh, big guys now and uh, I never had a chance. To... So that one aspect that I positively about that dire period that you all uh, been going through. Thank you. How about you, Serkan? What, what have you learned <coughs> yes, about yourself yes. during this period? Yeah, just... Uh, like all of us, we are working very busy and uh, time is running up. So we are running, uh, just we are following the timeline that we had in our uh, agenda. And just a break on the timeline, uh, let us some uh, great time to get into our inner selves and at least uh, to check our experiences and maybe just uh, to create some new ideas and to reach to new conclusions from all these experiences that we have in the previous time. And uh, I, I really had great time with the use of this technology to meet uh, to, that we have many people's many contacts behind us during our visits and our work. And we had a very uh, good time, very valuable time. And we had some free speeches about uh, ourselves or about our industry. And uh, it, it was a great opportunity to uh, regain our contacts back and to uh, contact with them and to share some uh, Humanly interfaces, let's say, during a computer. With a computer, it's a little ironic, but uh, with the use of the computer, we had some uh, time to realize and to remember our old friends, to chat about uh, what we had in, in, in the previous years. So uh, it gives us, I, I believe, maybe our friends will agree with me, we have a time to stop and think uh, what we are doing exactly in this lovely planet. Thank you. How about you, Nikos? Well, um, I mean, everybody has uh, has been experiencing uh, this COVID situation uh, differently. For me, I, I guess I had the chance to realize that there is life without traveling um, and being on the plane almost every week. So I had, I had forgotten how is that, um, how does it feel? But at the same time, even though you know I have been using, like everyone else, uh, the technology in terms of communicating with uh, with people at work, with people um, you know within my family, with my friends. Uh, nevertheless, I I got to realize that regardless how strong and how sophisticated the technology will be, it will never replace the human interaction power. I mean, uh, and for me that that was that was a it was a lesson that uh, i think that a lot of people have um, have learned and uh, and that's for me uh, is a, is a good sign that you know as soon as the um, the new cases and uh, will stabilize and there's going to be the discovery of uh, of the medicine and the injection slowly but surely people will want to get back into interacting with one another away from screens and microphones and and you know i think that's that's the foundation of hospitality uh whether it's corporate business or leisure yes also i'm, I'm sure we all have seen some generous acts uh, that has been evident during this COVID period and i just want to show, share just a small story and i'd like to see ask you whether you have seen some generous acts during this time uh, the Lapland, uh, where they had a great uh, uh, winter season, and they had one of the very popular activities are husky rides. And in 2019, there were more husky uh, ride operators that, that started. And, uh, and, but then when the COVID hit, of course, that business dropped dramatically. And there were many wondering that how can they survive until, if 
they don't have a season for the winter of uh, uh, 2020. And there were threats, actually, that they would put away the small puppies uh, and also the young ones that they've been training for the season. So this created a, a very emotional upstir here in Finland. And there were people starting to donate money. Uh, uh, it was one uh, uh, dog food manufacturer that uh, donated 20,000 uh, 20, kilos of, of dog food to make sure that they're, they're going to stay hungry. And people started to offer the opportunity to, if nothing else, they were happy to adopt a husky for themselves. So that was sort of a small thing that happened during this time, and uh, which well, I was surprised about. Uh, not in a way surprised, but I, I was happy to see that uh, there is a passion about many things. So I was wondering, anything from your part of the world that you have seen, which are sort of the generous acts uh, during this COVID period? Uh, Dr. Hisham. Well, uh, similar to the story just mentioned, uh, uh, in our uh, upper Egypt, in, in a city like Luxor or uh, by the uh, Nile River or uh, Aswan, there is a lot of uh, uh, people that is depending on tourism, uh, like uh, Kalesh owners that has horses and horse carriages. They take the uh, tourists around in the city and uh, they live on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, uh, Feluka, those boats on the Nile uh, to take them uh, around on a, uh, a Nile ride in that sense. They lost the, uh, the opportunities in that uh, because of what had happened of the pandemic. But um, on one hand, the government and other uh, respectable businessmen and uh, Egyptian citizens uh, group together to collect money and donate money for the food and the medication of the horses and the animals in these uh, cities in Egypt, which is uh, a very generous act in that sense. And I believe uh, it gives a very good signal for people getting together in those some difficult times, which lifted the spirit and gave some uh, positive feeling that uh, we can hang in together until the uh, that storm passes and we get back to normal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Serkan, anything you'd like to share? Yes, uh, during the lockdown period, uh, Eric, just uh, when the general lockdown ended in Turkey, just the lockdowns for elderly people who are older than 60 uh, go, uh, goes on for a long period, about uh, two months. And during this period, a voluntary group uh, emerged from the social media and for the elderly people who doesn't have kids or uh, relatives who are close for them, for their shoppings and for their daily needs, just a network created, totally volunteered from, uh, without any uh, political or government connection. And people uh, checked the relatives, neighbors who are around them, and people created a network. And this network daily, some days daily and routinely, check these elderly people for their shopping needs, for their daily needs, for the things that they may need to buy uh, outside. And this volunteer working group spread it all over the country, especially in the big cities. And thousands of people joined this group in their uh, off time. And they make shopping for old people. They take what, even, even to buy a coffee or tea, some people are volunteered to uh, help these uh, elderly people. And it was fantastic and we had Really fantastic stories uh, emerging on the social media. Fantastic. Uh, Nikos, anything you'd like to share on this point? Uh, actually, I had seen the same initiative uh, being done in, uh, from what Serkan was saying, in Germany and the US. So I'm glad that, you know, there are people with a similar uh, mindset. Uh, now, from the ones that I have was able to, um, um, to see or hear, is basically a number of um, very wealthy um, Greek business people basically uh, had made donations, uh, whether it was masks um, or um, uh, gloves. Uh, these are, which of course, during the first couple of months uh, were an extremely scarce commodity. And and, for, and of course, I'm, I'm, and unfortunately, um, some traders were really taking advantage of it uh, charging two or three times uh, more than it was supposed to be. Uh, so with the with the action of those um, wealthy business people, basically they managed to be able to offer um, easily 100 to 200,000 masks and pairs of gloves uh, to people 
that were in need um, in hospitals um, to medical staff that also was running short uh, because of the influx of um, of incidents that are coming in, but also to a number of refugees that Greece has been basically um, hosting now for the last couple of years. And unfortunately, they were, you know, they have been living through very difficult living conditions. Very good. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for this very interesting episode, an interesting discussion, and for your great thoughts and inspiration to all the viewers. And we will conclude this episode for now. And I just want to mention that uh, we are back next week, and we are going to. Our next episode will be from North America, the day after the election. Uh, and we're not talking about politics, but more about uh, tourism and. Uh, <laughs> and uh, hopefully the positive things that uh, may come up over there and uh, since you have if you are having not chance to see our live feature or you'd like to know when we are going next live you can either go to uh, the winning.training uh, portal which is the uh, portal that to who with whom we are working for this show but also you can go to uh, my youtube channel sam eric rutman or if you are if you are following me here on linkedin Join me here also. I'll put all the announcements on the various channels to make sure that everyone will have a chance to see it. And also I put it on Twitter, in fact, to make sure that the ones who didn't see it will see it anyway. So with this last word, I want to like to thank the viewers. I'd like to thank the replay viewers who didn't join us live. And I'd like to thank my friends, Moen, Shinaz, and John Podaras in Dubai and everyone else who I don't see their names for joining us. So Stay well and stay safe. Thank you very much, Jan. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, Thank for inviting you. us. Thank Take you. Bye-bye.